A note to the listeners, episode 22 contains some explicit language. Fairy Tale Kingdom by Robin Vigfusen. The kids were so awed by Disneyland, they seemed disoriented, their eyes glassy as if they were suffering from heat stroke. They exhaustively recounted the day's adventures at Autopia and Splash Mountain. They'd waited over an hour to get into Tower of Terror, only to be told the ride had broken down, so they'd gone to Pirates of the Caribbean instead. Then they showed off all their Disney swag. Mickey Mouse ears, plush Dalmatian puppies, Toontown mugs. It was so fun, six-year-old Ian assured his mother, Julia. Julia's husband, Colin, had taken the kids exploring today, and he would be taking them again tomorrow without her. Julia refused to leave the hotel. She'd spent the day drinking margaritas by the pool. She hadn't expected the dazed hordes on Main Street, USA, or the stale, relentless heat. The avalanche of visitors walked in a stupor, or sat down on sidewalks, overwhelmed as if they'd been evacuated from another city. The shortest line had been to Alice's adventures in Wonderland, and Julia and the kids had ridden it five times just to escape the crowds and the sun. At least it was air-conditioned, with singing flowers in hypnotizing pastels. Even Snow White's scary adventures were restful compared to the rabble in the park. They rode through a cave of cool purple darkness that jostled dormant memories like Snow White's plaintive love song or the dwarves' snug cottage. Julia's nine-year-old daughter Gemma pointed to the iridescent fireworks outside. It was dark, and they could see the nightly parade from their window. Look, Mommy, isn't it fantastic? Julia felt mocked by the glittery splendor. Her agreement to come here might have been a last fragment of magical thinking. After all, at the heart of the Disney creed was the tenant, wishing will make it so. Tomorrow was their last day here. By the weekend, they'd fly home and Colin would move out. He'd leased a brownstone in Brooklyn, and she was keeping the house in Maplewood. For the past six months, after he'd announced he wanted a divorce, they'd managed to live together in tense coexistence. Nothing she could do would change his mind. He'd made it clear she was the same to him as a job he'd come to loathe. She almost marveled at how resolute his antipathy toward her was, no doubts or conflicts that might torture the situation. A friend of hers had intimated there had to be another woman, though at first he denied it. Finally he confessed, like waving a flag of surrender, just to put a halt to her daily onslaught of tears and rage. His new woman was younger and accomplished, a successful publicist. He was a mediocre filmmaker about to explore branding and marketing, and this woman would be bringing a lot to their union. Julia was fifty, and whatever she'd had to offer was apparently spent. Because of his eagerness to leave, Julia would be getting a generous settlement. More than fair, was how his lawyer had put it. She looked at Colin and the children watching fireworks. Gemma had gotten a fairy princess makeover at the bibbidi bobbidi boo Boutique. She wanted to look like Ariel the mermaid, but the harsh lipstick and lacquered hair were emblematic of children's beauty pageants. Julia was filled with disgust. Colin had been adamant the kids weren't to know about the divorce until he told them himself after the trip was over. He was even approaching the trauma like the hack director he was, as if it was one of his movies. Their time together would end happily in Disneyland. He'd taken countless pictures as evidence for them to pour over in years to come. He bent over to kiss Gemma in her slick mermaid makeup and hairdo, and it was more than Julia could bear, almost as if he were about to molest her. "'You don't have an ounce of fucking shame, do you?' she hissed, unable to stop herself. "'Tell them. Tell them you're leaving. He's leaving us. For another woman.' Both children looked at their parents in horror and screamed, then ran and locked themselves in the bathroom. "'Perfect!' Colin spat and looked murderous. They knocked on the bathroom door pleading for the children to come out, but they wouldn't open the door as if they'd barricaded themselves against monsters, as if a witch and an ogre were waiting for them outside. Thank you.
Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. If you caught last week's Armistice Day episode, you will notice we are back to normal, back to our usual format. I enjoyed our storytelling aberration last week, and I hope you did as well, but we're doing what we do today. I don't know if you can tell on the recording, but both of the stories, Fairy Tale Kingdom, which you just heard, and Open Door, which is coming up next, left me a little emotional today. And I don't know if that translated in the recording or not. If I didn't do those recordings justice, my apologies to our contributors. Robin Vigfusen and AJ Patry have both waited a long time to have these stories recorded, and I'm so grateful to them for sharing them. But I was left pretty emotional reading both of these stories. I think they're tough reads, but I also think they're really important. So I'm going to kind of leave my commentary about those stories at that and just let you enjoy them today. I do have a couple of announcements, things going on in the podcast. First of all, by the time you listen to this, you will probably already have released on your feed, if you're a subscriber, the promo for our Christmas cereal special. This has been something that has been in the works for a long time, and I'm really excited to bring it to you in December. We try to keep our episodes around here under 15 minutes. We sometimes fail, but we try. These are not going to be. They're going to be on the lengthy side. So if you have a 15-minute slot in which you usually listen to us for December, double it, and you'll get all the great listening in. It's going to be a ton of fun. I'm looking forward to it. So if you haven't heard the promo, go to noextrawords.wordpress.com. There's just a quick little 30 seconds there to give you a little teaser as to what's coming. And stay tuned to noextrawords.wordpress.com all the month of December for all the fun details about our Christmas cereal. The other thing that's happening is on Friday, I'm guest blogging over at the Almost Average blog. That's almostaverage.wordpress.com. My topic is National Novel Writing Month-ish, <laughs> because I can't stay with one topic. So it's a little bit National Novel Writing Month. That's a little bit why I always wanted to own a bookstore. And so that's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Jason Nugent, for letting me ramble away on his blog for a little bit. That will be out on Friday. Coming next week, our Thanksgiving episode. The title is Thankful? Question mark. So stay tuned for that. It will be released by Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And also look for a little No Extra Words special that's coming to you sometime over Thanksgiving weekend. It'll just be a quick little thing that will pop up in your feed. A little thankful gift to you. Um... When I keep saying your feed, if you would like to become a subscriber to the show, please search for us in iTunes, search for us in Stitcher, search for us in Podcast Addict. I'm an Android phone user. That's my favorite. Um, wherever you find podcasts is where you can find us. Just click the subscribe button and then new episodes will just, and all these little extra tidbits will just pop right into your phone, right into your computer, right into wherever it is that you listen. Those links are at noextrawords.wordpress.com. Becoming a subscriber does not commit you. iTunes does not tell me who you are. Stitcher does not tell me who you are. It does not put me you on my mailing list. It just means that when new episodes come, you get them. That's all it means. I'm going to get you back to the stories. Open Door by AJ Patry is coming up next, and I hope you have a great week. Open Door by A.J. Patry Did I lock the front door? You know that I never, ever remember if I have, and how you inevitably are the person who reassures me that yes, I did indeed lock it on the way out. Now that you cannot talk to me, I find it extremely unsettling to think about our home being open to the world, all the burglars and thieves in the city making their way into it, walking in with impunity and ferrying away all our worldly possessions. Oddly enough, it doesn't feel like a vacuum has been created where your voice once existed. You would think that that is how it would feel, to have a person you are close to suddenly stop talking to you. Instead, it feels like all the ambient noise of the world around me has been amplified tenfold, expanding and occupying the space that once belonged to your voice. Everyone around me seems so eager to bridge this chasm created by your silence. I am touched by their sincerity and their good intentions, but their efforts aren't making any difference. They cannot replace your voice in my life. You know what? I think I did lock that front door after all. If I close my eyes now and think deeply, I can almost hear the phantom click of the key turning, the gears grinding into place and securing our home. All you have to do is touch my arm and tell me what you have told me so many times before, that you were right beside me when I locked the door. And you have always been beside me, as you are now. 
It has been, what, fourteen years? I still remember your voice from back then. Whenever you spoke, I would be transfixed by those humongous braces of yours, that ridiculous contraption your mother made you wear, and which made sure that you could never completely close your mouth. Your garbled speech taunting me, a natural trait of adolescence in their behavior towards people they love, love which they are incapable of expressing. Your exact words fail my memory now. I only remember the tone of your voice, the mock anger and incredulity, delivered in a screechy voice that made my spine tingle in the most unromantic way possible. That voice would mellow ever so gently with age, breathing in the airs of change that college and work brought to your life. The only time your old voice made a brief reappearance was when you pushed Ari out of you. All I could do was stand there and splutter and gasp like a dying man, even as I saw our daughter being born. She keeps asking about you, you know. Ari does. She cannot understand why you will not speak any more, why you keep lying in your bed in the hospital oblivious to her presence. She asked me yesterday if Mummy and Papa fought. In her own ingenious way, she is painting herself as a victim of a fight between us. I was tempted to say yes, thinking quite foolishly that it would stem the barrage of questions that flow from her. But I knew it would not help, so I just sat there with my head down, trying hard to distract her attention with her toys. Do you think her toys would be safe from a thief? Will a man walk into a little child's bedroom and decide to steal a large teddy bear the color of burnt caramel? It would seem a silly thing to do, too conspicuous. Someone would notice. They might alert the police. And then what? Would the police start a hunt for a teddy bear thief? Would they find him in a squalid little apartment using the bear as a makeshift pillow? Or would they discover that he sold it at a flea market for a fraction of the price we paid for it? Either way, the damage would be done, don't you think? I know you will agree with me when I say there is no way I will ever take that teddy bear back into our home and into the hands of our daughter. Ari would be heartbroken. And all this might have been so easily avoided if I had remembered to lock the door. The one time you weren't beside me, when you went to get the car started on the driveway because we were getting late for the meeting with Ari's teachers. And then you made me go back to check the door. And by the time I turned around, the truck had already sped past, and you were lying there on the road like one of Ari's broken toys. That was four months ago, and now the doctors and the family tell me that you would have done the right thing. What is this right thing? It's a strange creature, so mutable in character. Would doing the right thing mean abandoning all hope that you will speak again? They have no answer to that, which confirms exactly what they want me to do. They actually had me convinced, I must admit that to you. I set out from home today, closing a door that I may or may not have locked, with what I thought was a firm resolution in my heart to do this right thing to come here and pull the plug on these machines that are keeping you alive, to go back and tell Ari that her mother is never coming home again. But sitting here beside you now, I know that I cannot do it. I can never be certain that you will not break your silence one of these days. I would like to believe that you will wake up, look at me, smile, and prove them all wrong. I want to wait for that day. Till it arrives, I will keep my door unlocked.